All right, so uh, just leave your Bibles open there in Psalm 19 and look at verse number 1, Psalm 19. And turn there, Psalm 19 and verse number 1 reads, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. The title for the sermon tonight is The Heavens Declare. The Heavens Declare. The Bible is very clear about this topic, right? When we look up to the heavens, when we look up to the sky, when we look at, at, at the clouds and the sun and the moon and the stars, and we look up at all creation that God has done, that the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens, the creation, acknowledge who God is, that there is a God, that there is a creator. And then it says, it says there, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Okay, so when we look at creation, the first thought that should come into your mind is look at this great God that I serve. When you know how far the stars are, when you know how, how, uh, how expansive space is, and you know even how, how even the smallest atom and even the subatomic particles that make up the atom are so complex. You know, when you look at the human eye and you look at all creation, you look at whatever it is, brethren, you just stop and meditate for a moment and look at the handiwork of God, it makes you realize what a powerful, what a mighty God that we serve. All right, that He can fling those stars in space with His own hands. And the Bible says, I'm just dust. <laughs> you know, when, when you look at all of creation, you look at us, you know, the significance of man, we're, we're but dust. And yet, God can do great things through us because of His Holy Spirit, right? And so, when we look at His creation, you know, we are to think about who God is. But notice at the beginning it said there, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the first thing I want you to notice there is heavens is plural, right? More than one. Are there more than one heaven? The Bible is very clear that there is definitely more than one heaven. In fact, and we'll go through this later on, the Bible tells us that there are three heavens. Three heavens. Now it says here, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay? So there's more than one heaven that declares the glory of God. Now, spoiler, but the third heaven that we see back, and we'll look at this later on, is where God's throne is. All right? That's the, when we talk about heaven, we talk about going to heaven, you know, being with God, that's what the Bible refers to as the third heaven. Can you see the third heaven? Can you look at it and say, yes, the third heaven declares the glory of God. I can see the handiwork of God. No, we, we can't see that third heaven, can we? But we can see two heavens, plural, which declare the glory of God. And of course, the first heaven refers to our atmosphere, is to our sky, okay? The clouds, the birds flying through the atmosphere, that's heaven number one. Heaven number two is where the sun, the moon, and the stars are, right? Outer space, as we call them. These are two heavens that we can look at which declare the glory of God. You say, why are you bringing that up? Well, this becomes important as we keep going. Look at verse number two. Verse number two, it says, Day unto day utter of speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You know what the Bible's telling us here? Is that all of creation, even the day and night, speak of who God is. Right? It says, day unto day utter of speech. The day speaks about who God is. When we look at heaven, we see, like I said, you know, like I mentioned, the, the clouds. We see the, 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 the you know, the uh, birds flying in the atmosphere. That declares who God is. And then it says, and night unto night showeth knowledge. So when it's night and you see the stars and you see the moon and you can see the planets, you know, this is to give us knowledge. It, it's to speak to us of who God is. I remember one of my old pastors, and I, I need to do this, kids, one day. He says, you know, he goes, I really recommend you one day take your kids camping and just, you know, a place where you're away from the noise, from the lights of a city, and just lay down on your backs with your children, look up to the skies. And he said, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at how many stars there are. Your kids will be able to acknowledge and appreciate the greatness of God. And that's what the heavens are there for. It's to point us to God, right? The day speaks to us about God. The night gives us knowledge about God. Verse number three. There is no speech, nor language, where their voice is not heard. Whose voice is not heard? The voice of the heavens, the voice of the, of the day and night, right? This is what we're talking about, the creation here. And so here's what's wonderful about the, the creation, is that it, all, it speaks the universal language, right? I mean, as an English speaker, you probably, you know, the best you can do with preaching the gospel, telling people about God is to another English speaker. You're going to struggle with somebody that speaks a foreign language. All right? But the wonderful thing about creation, it speaks to everybody of every language. No matter who it is, they can look at creation and say, wow, this is a God that I want to worship. You know? And the question often is, you know, what about you know, uh, in the deepest jungles, uh, jungles of Africa? What if they don't hear about Jesus? Hey, well, they have the creation. They have the day and night. They have the handiwork of God at their disposal. 
And I tell you this, brethren, if they can say, yes, I want to know that God, I want to know the Creator God, God will prepare it in the heart of a missionary, a man to go out there, even if it's for that one person, to give them the gospel. You know, the Bible is very clear that if we seek, we shall find. And so, you know, we shouldn't have this idea, what about the person that didn't hear? Listen, they may not have heard from this, but what they have right now is to be able to hear creation, to see creation, to acknowledge the God of the universe. And if they're seeking God, if they want to worship God and not the creation, then God will make himself known unto them, for sure, guaranteed. We see that in the Bible. Look at verse number, and by the way, it says there, uh, there is no speech nor language where there voice is not heard now the you know the the, the word there more, more often than not is again plural right we already started to see the heavens plural declare the glory of god and notice look at, look at verse number four it says their line now i'll just tell you what this line represents it just means sound i'll prove that to you later on okay their line or their sound remember they're uttering speech remember they're telling us about god all of creation their sound or line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them have he set a tabernacle for the sun. And so the Bible here now refers to the sun. And of course, the sun is, is a mighty creation of God. And it says here that in the heavens, all right, which, which is uh, where, where their line is coming from, or, or their words to the end of the world, this is declaring basically a testimony of the sun. And when it says that in them have he set a tabernacle for the sun, a tabernacle is another way of saying a dwelling place. And so where is the, the place for the sun? Where is the dwelling place for the sun? It is in the heavens, okay? It is in, well, we, we know it as the second heaven, right? Outer space. That's where the sun is. This becomes important. Look at verse number five. Which is as a bridegroom, talking about the sun here, a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, all right? So the sun, when it, when it starts to rise and it starts to shine and the light starts to come forth and brightness and the glory of the sun, it, it compares it to a man who's about to get married. All right, a man who's got a big smile on his face, he's got his wife, I'm going to get married. Praise God. That's the description, you know. That's, you know, obviously this is poetic language, right? Description there of the sun. And then it says, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Okay, so it's like the strong man that's about to run this race, right? He's getting up, he's getting ready for that run. All day long he's going to be running that race. Look at verse number six. He's going forth, he's from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And so the sun has a circuit, right? It, it, you know, it, it has a, a uh, uh, well, from our perspective, right? It has a trajectory that it travels, right? The sun rises from the east and it uh, sets in the west, you know? And so it runs that circuit, as it were, right? Uh, and then it says this, it says, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. You can't stop the heat of the sun. You can try to, you know, you know get some shade. You can get the air conditioning units on, right? But where the sun shines there's going to be heat you can't stop that that's the mighty power and creation of god you can't stop the sun and yet the sun is such a massive you know object it's such a huge creation it's such a powerful creation and yet it doesn't compare to the god who created it okay so the heavens declare the glory of god it's amazing when you think about this world and the solar system and the stars and the planets and just the tiny little, you know, microorganisms that God has put in this world, it all testifies that there is a creator God. And uh, what I want you to do now, please keep a finger there and go to Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Because I told you how important it is to say that the, you know, to acknowledge that the heavens declare the glory of God, right? The heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. And so let's understand these three heavens that I already uh, mentioned to you. Let's understand this from a biblical perspective. And listen, Genesis chapter 1, you know, please make that a foundational chapter for your spiritual life. There are so many great truths in this chapter. You know, if you just read it, you'll, over, you know, you, 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 you'll miss a lot of it, right? But, uh, you know, Genesis is the book of beginnings. Genesis is the foundational book of the rest of the Bible. But Genesis chapter 1 is a foundational book of many other truths as well, all right? I mean, this makes sense that God would, in the very first chapter, teach us some very important truths. It says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So from the very beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. And I'm going to put it to you that this heaven that was created here is where God dwells. Okay, and the earth. Let's keep going. We'll drop down to verse number 7. Now it says here in verse number 7, and God made the firmament. What's the firmament? Well, let's keep going. And divided the waters which were under the firmament 
from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So did God make something now? Yeah, He makes the firmament, right? So this isn't the same heaven that He created in, in verse number 1. This is something else. Look at verse, let's keep going, verse number 8. And God called the firmament heaven. See that? And the evening and the morning were the second day. So on the second day, God creates another heaven. On the first day, the very beginning, He creates a heaven and earth. But then on the second day, He creates another heaven. Say, what is that about? Well, let's keep going. Uh, verse number, let's drop down to verse number 14. Verse number 14. And by the way, that ferment that was created above the waters, well, when you look at the earth, we have waters. We have seas and oceans. Well, what's that space above the waters? It's our atmosphere. Okay, so this firmament or this heaven is our local atmosphere, right? Where the clouds are, where if you're on a jet plane, you're flying through that heaven. Okay, it's where the birds fly. I'll show you that later on. But look at uh, verse number 14 now, and you'll see another firmament that comes into view here. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So God wants to put these lights in the firmament, right? Look at verse number 16, and we saw that firmament is just another way of saying it, heaven, right? Verse number 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and that's the sun, of course, and the lesser light to rule the night. Okay, so that's the moon. But notice this, this is important. He made the stars also. So when he's creating things to be put into this firmament, what is he putting into it? The sun, the moon, and the stars, okay? Fact, this is proof in the Bible, right? Fact, look, let's keep going, verse number 17. And God set them, what's the them? The stars, the sun, and the moon, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. What do we learn there? There is a firmament, or there is a heaven, that contains, must contain, according to God's word, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Say, why are you saying that? Well, what I'm saying is, the first heaven is where the birds fly. The second heaven, out of space, is where the sun, moon, and stars are. And the third heaven is where God's throne is. Okay? And so when we talk about the heavens declaring the glory of God, it's the first heaven, it's the second heaven. We can't see the third heaven. At least not on this side of eternity, right? Uh, but, you know, one day we will definitely see, set our eyes upon that third heaven. Let's keep going. Look at verse number 20. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 20. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, verse number 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that have life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So what can fly in the open firmament of heaven? Birds. Okay, so again, that's the atmosphere, right? So in Genesis 1, we see the three heavens, where God is, where the birds fly, and where the sun, moon, and stars are. Okay, and again, where the birds fly, where the clouds are, that's one, that's, one, that's one heaven that declares the glory of God. But we saw that it's the heavens that declare the glory of God. That's the sun, moon, stars. That's outer space. All right? And you say, why is that important? Well, I'm just going to read to you. You don't need to turn there. And actually, what I want to turn to is go to Isaiah 11 for me. Go to Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. And I'll put this all together for you shortly. Okay? You go to Isaiah 11. But I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 2. A very familiar portion of Scripture to many of you. And this is Paul writing about himself in the third person. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. So Paul says there is a third heaven, speaking of himself in the third person because he's speaking about the new man, not the old man, right? That's in heaven. And he says that's the third heaven. So listen, if there's a third heaven, doesn't that make sense that there's a second and a first heaven? which is consistent with what we just read there in Genesis chapter 1, right? I mean, that's not, that's not complicated, right? That should be straightforward. And then it says in verse number 3, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So this third heaven is also called paradise, okay? This is heaven, the, the heaven that we think about when we teach people about, you know, are you sure about going to heaven? When we give them the gospel, we want their soul to go to heaven where God is. That's the third heaven. Now, the reason I bring this to your attention is because there is a teaching that's becoming very popular on the internet, and that's a teaching on the flat earth, okay, on the flat earth. 
And uh, you know what? The Bible tells us that the heavens declare His glory. All right? So here's something that we need to understand. If what I just explained to you about the three heavens, okay, and two of them declare His glory, that's got to be correct. It's consistent with the Bible. Well, if this is, you know, these objects, these heavens are there to declare His glory. But what if the flat earth's understanding of the atmosphere and of outer space is inconsistent with the Bible? Does it declare the glory of God? If it's inconsistent. You say, how is it inconsistent? Well, let me explain to you a couple of things here, you know. I was looking up flat earth today, all right? <laughs> and I was saying, well, how, you know, how do they explain the, the atmosphere? And if you, don't, if you don't know this already, you know, the flat earth teaching basically teaches that the sun and moon are in our first heaven. They're in the same heaven where the birds fly. That's the flat earth teaching, right? And you say, that's crazy. Listen, there's a lot of people that believe this. And look, it doesn't bother me that people believe this. What bothers me is when people try to use the Bible to say that's what it teaches. Now, you say, well, where do the flat earthers put the stars? Well, they put them in another space, above the sun and moon. Okay, now, it was hard to get this information. I had to look up a, a lot of sources. But what seems consistent is they believe the stars are in another location, above the sun and the moon. All right, where the sun and moon is basically in our atmosphere. So it's obviously much smaller objects they teach. And the, then the stars are in another, maybe the second heaven from their perspective. I, I don't know. Okay? And yet, what did we learn in Genesis chapter 1? Where did God put the stars? He put it in the same heaven as the sun and the moon. And so if you're a flat earther and you believe Genesis chapter 1, you must also believe then that the stars are in our atmosphere as well. And yet, no flat earther believes that. That's inconsistent with the Bible. And if it's inconsistent with the Bible, it's not declaring the glory of God. Okay, we want to declare the glory of God and what we understand in science, what we understand by observation and by experimentation must be true of the Word of God. It must be consistent. And you'll see in this, in this psalm, Psalm 19, how important the creation is and the Word of God. These two things go together to declare us the maker and the creator of all things. All right? Now, you're in Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 11. I hope that makes sense to you. What I just said, right? The Bible is very clear. Stars are in the same place, in the same heaven as the sun and the moon. Amen. Again, flat earthers believe the sun and the moon are in our atmosphere, here where the birds fly, just higher. That means the stars are here, but they don't believe that. Okay? Oh, we just want the truth. Genesis 1 is the truth. Yeah. The stars and the moon and the sun in one place, the heaven. Heaven's plural. There's got to be two places that declare the glory of God. All right? Now, look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. Now, I, I once spoke to a flat earther. And listen, I've got flat earther friends. So I want you to understand that. I'm not, I, don't, I don't hate them, you know. But I want them to get things, I want, I want them to get this right, especially if it's inconsistent with the Bible. You know, if we say the Bible's our final authority, it's got to be the final authority, not just when we like it, okay? Gen Isaiah, and they said, I got told by a flat earther, you know, the earth can't be a sphere. And I said, why not? He says, because the Bible says the four corners of the earth, okay? And if there's corners, then it's got to be, a, you know, a place that you can fall off that corner or whatever, right? Four corners is like a square or a rectangle. And I said to him, but you don't even believe it's a square or a rectangle. You do believe it's circular in shape. You just believe it's flat. So even in a normal circle, you know, what makes the, the, the circle a shape is that it has no corners, all right? So you, you can't say the earth is not a sphere because the Bible says corners of the earth. Well, then it can't be a flat circle either because it doesn't have corners either. The, the argument against the sphere is the same argument against your belief. You know, so what is the corners of the earth? And here's the thing, brethren. You know, I, I don't mind if you believe the flat earth. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. But it's to your detriment. Okay, it's to your detriment. Because you're going to try to find verses in the Bible that line up with this belief. And you're not going to be able to differentiate between what is literal and what is figurative. And if you can't do that, you're going to be messed up in a lot of other doctrines. All right. Look at Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, verse 11. Let me tell you what the four corners of the earth is. It's not complicated. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Now, where, is, where are his, the remnant of his people? Notice this. From Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. So the, the remnant of God's people are scattered throughout all these nations, all right? Look at verse number 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel 
and gathered together the dispersed, those are the people that in the other, other nations, of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Well, there it is, it's flat. So all, all these Jews, all these people of God, you know where they went? They went to the corners. They went to the right at the edge of the earth, right, where they're about to fall off. And that's where God's bringing them from. Is that what the Bible teaches us? No, He's bringing them from the nations that surround Israel. All right? Say, so what is four corners? It's not complicated. It's north, south, east, and west. We still use that phrase today. In fact, there's a television show, an Australian, what is it? It's called Four Corners. Do you know it? It's an Australian show, right? Why is it called Four Corners? Because they teach the flat earth? No, they call it Four Corners because they're getting news from all places of the, of the globe, right? North, south, east, and west is where they're getting the news from. That's why they call themselves Four Corners. Not because it's a documentary on flat earth. All right, now let's keep going. Look, verse number 13. Now, do you see that though? Do you see that the four corners of the earth are referred to all the nations that his people were dispersed? Okay, it's, it's in, in, so what? What is it? It's, it's north, south, east, and west, right? It's places that surround it. I'll prove this to you further. Look at verse 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Look at this, verse 14. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west and shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. So where are they coming from? East and west. The four corners, well, that's two corners, right? The four corners, north and south as well. And so if we keep this within context, the four corners are just the different directions of the different nations that surround Israel, where the dispersed people of God had gotten to. All right? So do we believe in the circle of the earth? The Bible's very clear that the, sh the earth is shaped like a circle, right? Now, is it a flat circle? Well, you could make that argument if we lived in a two-dimensional world, all right? I mean, if, if you just had a two-dimensional circle, I guess you could make the argument that it's flat. But is that realistic? Do we live in a two-dimensional world or do we live in a three-dimensional world? We live in a three-dimensional. That's, that's, that's realistic. That's truth. That's fact that we live in a three-dimensional world. And what is a circle in a three-dimensional world? It's a sphere, okay? That means no matter how you cut that sphere, it's going to have the shape of a circle. The whole thing's a circle, and a sphere has no corners. But does a, does a globe have uh, north, south, east, and west, in four corners in that sense? Absolutely it does. And so is the Bible consistent? Absolutely it is consistent, okay? And we have the globe, we have the first heaven where the birds fly, we have the second heaven where the stars, moon, and sun are, and we have the third heaven where God's throne is. All right? This is the teaching of the Bible. It's consistent with the Bible, it's understandable, and it's consistent with the science that we know. Why do we have to fight a science that is consistent with the Bible? To come up with some crazy idea where you start blurring the lines between what is literal and what is figurative, well, you read Genesis chapter 1 and you don't want to accept it because, you know, this truth is too important for me and I, I have to just find some other solution to these questions. Listen, we don't need to fight stupid battles. Okay, there's, there's, we're going for the armor of God, aren't we? There's, there's enough of a battle to fight in this world than fighting, you know, fighting for some stupid science. Now, again, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. You guys can believe whatever you like. It doesn't bother me personally. But I care for your souls. All right, I'm an overseer for your souls and I find this will be a detriment to your understanding of the Word of God if you keep pursuing this science, this, falsely, this science falsely so-called. You know, how, do you, how are you so sure, Pastor Kevin, that it, you know, it's a globe earth? Well, you know what? As soon as I found out about the flat earth, I did a little bit of research, I watched some videos, I just, you know, I didn't watch it to ridicule, I just wanted to understand why do people think this? And then I thought, okay, I get where they're coming from. I get some of their observations. I get, I get where they're coming from. But let's plot this out on, a fl on flights. You know, I've taken a lot of flights in my life. I mean, my whole life I've been flying, right? And I've taken that flight from Santiago, Chile, to Sydney, I don't know, at least 10 times. Direct flights from Sydney to Santiago, which takes like 12 and a half hours and 14 hours in, on the way back. And I just charted that on the flat earth. And it, doesn't, it doesn't work, brethren. It's impossible. It takes like 40 hours to take that flight on a flat earth, but on a globe earth, it's perfect. It's perfect. You know? And here's the thing. If you look at the flat earth, you, you look at how many flat earthers there are that make videos. You know where they're from? The Northern Hemisphere. When you look at the, the people that are debunking flat earthers on, on YouTube, you know where they're from? Australia. 
from the Southern Hemisphere? You say, why is that? <laughs> i tell you why. Because a lot of people in the Northern Hemisphere have not traveled to the Southern Hemisphere, okay? Because most people live in the Northern Hemisphere, right? If you're in America and you want to go on holidays, you're probably going to go to Europe or something, which is the Northern Hemisphere, right? You go to Asia. You know, people go to Asia, they go to Europe. Not many people travel to the Southern Hemisphere. Most often, people in the Southern Hemisphere will travel to the Northern Hemisphere, okay? And when you're traveling to the Northern Hemisphere, and this is something I observed when I went to the uh, missions conference at Faithful Word Baptist Church, I, I love going to America because I love looking at the night sky, and I'm not this stargazer, like I'm not crazy about these things, but I can look up at the night sky and say, wow, that's different. It's different. The night sky is different to the normal night sky that you see here. You see some of the same stars, you see some of the same constellations, but you can see other constellations, you can see other stars. You know why? Because they're on different sides of the globe. If it was a flat earth, you'd see the same thing no matter where you go. Okay, it's on different sides of the, of the globe, and you've got the tilt, so you see different you know, differences in the night sky. Now, look, you don't even have to be that knowledgeable to work it out. You know, if you've been living in the summer, summer, you know, Southern Hemisphere for years and years and years, you look up every now and again, you know, that starts to imprint in your mind what the sky looks like. And then you go to the Northern Hemisphere, you look up again, you say, wow, that looks different. It, it is different. <laughs> it is different because it's the other side of the globe. All right? And here's the other thing, brethren. The International Space Station. It's so easy to track. You just go on, the, on their website, you find out when they're orbiting, you know, and they're, they're constantly orbiting over this area, Brisbane, Caloundra. You just work out at what point they're going to orbit. You know, you set the time, you make sure that the sky is clear. You'll be able to look up and you'll be able to see that satellite go by. Why? Because it's orbiting the Earth, right? It's orbiting the Earth. That's why, you know. It's a globe, brethren. Don't waste your time on nonsense. Waste your time research. not waste your time. Use your time researching, studying the Bible, you know, and, and reality, Reality is going to help you uh, put these two things together. The, the heavens declare the glory of God, but also His Word declares His glory. You know, Pastor Tyler Doka. I mean, that guy is a classic example of a man. Now, if you don't know who he is, don't waste your time. But of a man who appeared to know the gospel, who appeared to be sound in faith. Then he went down the flat earth road. Now he denies the gospel or, he, you know, he preaches another gospel, he believes if you're saved, you're going to go to hell anyway if you don't live righteously enough, and they believe in some workspace gospel, right? I mean, this, this guy's just gone down the deep end, he's a false prophet, not only is he a false prophet, he's a reprobate, you know, and you're, why? Because he cannot read his Bible, he cannot tell the difference between what is literal and what is figurative. Amen. He cannot read Genesis chapter 1 and work out that the stars are in the same firmament as the sun and the moon. And again, this doesn't you know, if you believe it, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. But if one day you want to be a pastor and you're a flat earther, listen, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. Hey, and that title dog called his church pillar church now, whatever it is. <laughs> He's making a mockery of God's word. Do you think you, people will want to listen to a pastor who's a flat earther and doesn't understand Genesis chapter 1? No way. How are you going to teach the rest of the Bible when you can't even get through that first chapter? Listen, Genesis chapter 1 has a lot of great truths. It'll keep you from the flat earth, all right? It'll keep you from believing Genesis 6, fallen angels, because everything in chapter 1 gives, uh, brings forth after its own kind, all right? Not angels, you know, having fornication with, with women and having giants. Hey, it's going to keep you from modalism and, and, uh, and uh, oneness, because God says, let us make man in our, in our image, the Trinity, from Genesis chapter 1. We have a lot of great doctrines. You just, listen, if, if, if you're struggling in these, in these areas, just read Genesis chapter 1. Read it again. Memorize it. Meditate on Genesis chapter 1 until you get some of this bad doctrine out of your life. It's going to affect your ability to read the Bible. Okay? Let's keep going. Uh, Psalm 19. And if you can look back to verse number 4. Psalm 19 and verse number 4. Let's read it again. It says, Their line... Remember, I said this is the word sound. Okay, I'll compare. I'll show you this soon. Actually, keep your finger there and go to Romans chapter 10. Go to Romans chapter 10 for me. Go to Romans chapter 10. I'll read to you Psalm 19 verse 4 again. It says, Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So I was telling you how this is the testimony of creation. All right? But then when we get to Romans chapter 10, and we know Romans chapter 10 and we love that chapter, right? Because it's about the soul winner going out, preaching the gospel. Well, actually, in Romans chapter 10, this passage, in this uh, verse number 4, is repeated for us in Romans chapter 10. Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse number 15. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 15. 
It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed their report. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. We know that passage very well. But look at verse number 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound, or like Psalm 19 said, their line went into all the earth and their, sorry, and their words unto the ends of the world. And so Romans chapter 10 is quoting Psalm 19. And Psalm 19 is telling us how all of creation declares the glory of God. You know what that's comparing? It to, to the soul winner. So as a soul winner, just like the creation declares the glory of God, no, sorry, just as, yeah, just as creation declares the glory of God, so to you as a soul winner who takes the Bible, who takes the word of God and preaches the gospel. You're doing the same job. That's how people learn about God. That's how people believe on Jesus Christ. It's because they've seen creation. They acknowledge there must be a God. It takes more work to deny a God. In fact, nobody truly, you know, there's, there's no such thing as an atheist in the Bible. You know, God doesn't believe in atheists. You know, all the atheist does is he, he knows who God is, but decides to worship the creation rather than the creator. That's the only difference, okay? And once, you know, creation tells us here and in here that there is a God, then the soul winner comes with the word of God and shows, shows you, hey, look what Jesus did for you. Look at the God, the creator of all things. He cares so much even about you that he sent his only son to die for you. What a great message of the gospel. You know, these two things go together the creation of the world and the preaching of God's word to declare the glory of God. And, uh, and of course, you know, in, in the book of Romans, we're looking at Romans chapter 10, go to Romans chapter 1, go to Romans chapter 1. And of course, this is acknowledged for us because, you know, obviously, when you're reading Romans chapter 10, you should have been already read Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, this truth is, you know, reminded to us here in Romans chapter 1, verse 19. It says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God have showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so do atheists believe in God? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is why when you go door to soul winning, you don't need to get into some creation versus evolution debate. Don't just, just, just start with, your, with a belief, which is biblical, that they do believe in God. They just don't want to acknowledge Him. And just bypass that and get straight into the gospel. Okay, that's the power of God unto salvation. You know, the, the power of the gospel. And so what this is teaching us is that there are two great testimonies of the glory of God. Creation, the heavens, you know, yes, the atmosphere, and also outer space, yes, the plural heavens, declare the glory of God, but also His Word, okay? And so it's amazing that God allows us, you know, sinful flesh, to use His Word for such a great purpose, you know, to declare the glory of God. We have these two great testimonies. So if you go back to Psalm 19, Psalm 19, and this makes perfect sense now, because Psalm 19, all of a sudden, from talking about God's creation, gets into the Word of God. I mean, the rest of the psalm is about the Word of God now. Why? Because these are the two great testimonies of who God is, right? Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Making wise the simple. And so the law is perfect, converting the soul. Okay? And of course, you know, Galatians 3, 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And so the law of God does convert the soul. You know, when we're confronted with God's commandments and His laws, and we realize we've broken God's laws, I'm a sinner, who can save me? That should bring us to Christ. It shouldn't bring us to ourselves. So I've got to try harder now. I've got to repent of my sins. I've got to clean up my life. No. <laughs> no. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Say, Lord, man, I've messed up, and I guess I'm, I'm going to continue messing up because I'm a sinner, and that's why I need a Savior. That's why I need God's grace to save me, which is free, the free gift of salvation. Praise God for that. But it also says it makes wise the simple. 
You know, simply someone that's very base, someone that uh, doesn't have a lot of knowledge, someone that, I guess, is stupid, right? <laughs> if you consider yourself as someone who's not very intelligent, you know what's going to give you a lot of wisdom? Just spend time in God's Word. Amen. You've got it at your disposal. It's not going to cost you any. It's, you know what? You, you, you go to university, you spend all this big money, you go to school, you spend all textbooks, you spend all this stuff, right, to get trained. And yet the thing that's going to give you the greatest wisdom is free. It's, in your, it's probably in your hands right now. Probably got a bunch of them in your hands right now, right? And yet it's free. It's going to give you uh, wisdom. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Principle, the first thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. With all thy getting. Hey, use your time not researching the flat earth, not re- researching science falsely so-called. Spend your time with all you're getting his word. And I promise you this, with the Spirit of God, as a saved believer, He's going to give you much wisdom. Much wisdom. Okay? And I've grown in wisdom over the years. I'm sure if you've been saved for a while, you can say, yes, I've grown in wisdom. You probably look back to the days when I was like in my 20s, and I thought I knew it all, right? I'm a self-made man. I'm so smart. I look back now and say, what a foolish child I was back then, right? Because you gain wisdom, you know, as you spend more and more time in His Word. Look at verse number 8. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. Boy, you know, if you're someone that's depressed, you're cast down, you're struggling in life, you know what's going to give you a lot of joy? The statutes of the Lord. You know, going to the Bible, learning from God, allowing God to speak to you through His Word will give you great joy. It says the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Pure, it's pure, okay? Psalm 12, 6 says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. It's pure. And it says, enlightening the eyes. You know, we have a perspective of, of life. You know, it, based on your experiences, based on your, your education. You know, you, you look at the world for a, for a lens of everything that's been added up to, you know, the point of uh, years that you are at now, okay? And many times, our eyes are not looking clearly, though. You know, because we've been, uh, you know, we've, we've been brainwashed by the world. You know, we, we think, you know, we, we don't think the way God wants us to think. And so His Word, which is pure, and it's like pouring pure water into your eyes and getting rid of the dirt, right? And what, what God's Word does with the purity of it, it helps us to refocus, to stop looking at things through the lens of your old eyes and start seeing things through the lens of God. You know, starting to see His righteousness, start to see His judgments much clearer understanding how this world works much clearer than when your eyes were dim. Look at verse number uh, 9. It says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The fear of the Lord, it's important to have. I've been saved a long time, and there were times in my life when I just did not have the fear of God. I got far from God, I got distant from God, not reading my Bible, just living how I want, and not thinking about the consequences, there was no fear there. And there are other times in my life, you know, as you grow and you go through that, you know, Christianity sometimes is this wave, you know, you have your high moments, you have your low moments sometimes. In those high moments, I find myself fearing God the most. And I was telling my, the Sydney church on Sunday, you know, the point that I have the most fear of God is just before I get up to preach. I don't know if you observe me, but just before I get up to preach, I'm telling you, I'm shaking in my boots to get up, open up the Word of God to His people, to His children. God's using me to declare His glory. And I'm a fallen man. And I know I have sins. And I know I'm not right with God all the time. And I know I make mistakes. And I'm doing the best I can. You know? And I'm just like, God, please help me to preach the truth. You want the church to be the pillar and ground of the truth. You know, please show me your word. Please give me your spirit. And I think that's good because it said there, right? It said there, the fear of, what did it say? The fear of the Lord is clean. So when you fear God, it cleans you up. You know, and, and all, the, all the, maybe the pride that I might have and say, well, I'm such a good preacher. I have such great knowledge. Oh man, this church is doing so well because of me as a pastor. All of that is cleaned out, all right? And I have a fear of God and that's replaced by the power of God, the strength of God, which doesn't come from man. Okay? And, you, you know, preachers, you get up behind this pulpit to preach, you better have a fear of God. Remember who you're preaching to. It's not about edifying yourself. You're feeding people the Word of God. You're feeding His children. Could you imagine if I take my kids to a restaurant, and instead of, it, you know, the food being clean and well prepared, you know, it's full on the ground, they've spat on it, 
right? And then they bring it and they feed my kids. Do you think I'd be happy with that? I'd be, I'd be so angry about that, right? How do you think God will feel if you come up behind the pulpit and you don't care about it, you know, you just, you put no effort into it, you just do it and you're just highlighting yourself, the pride of man, you know, no, you better have a fear of God and clean you out of all that nonsense, okay? Clean you through, endure and forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Look at verse number 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. If you can please keep your finger there and go to Revelation chapter 10. Go to Revelation chapter 10. The psalmist says the Bible, the words of God, are to be desired more than gold, sweeter than honey. Wow. You know, there is a desire in man to, to work and provide, of course, you know, to, to build up a savings and have some gold on the side, a bit of, you know, uh, something for a rainy day. But, and that's, that's good. That, there's nothing wrong with having that, you know, needing that. But you know what should be your greater desire than that is the Word of God. You know, before you get up to go to work in the morning, please let me encourage you to just open the Word of God. Just at least one chapter. Get one chapter in. Desire the Word of God before you desire to get out there and, and work a job. You know what? God's Word will help you be a better employee in the first place anyway. Okay? More than gold, but also sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Do you ever get like sweet cravings sometimes? And you're like, man, I just need that piece of chocolate or whatever it is, right? Well, you know what? You should be desiring like that. Well, more than that, you know, is, is the Word of God. It's precious. It's sweet, you know? Before we read uh, Revelation, I'm just going to read to you from Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse number 1. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, Moreover, he said unto me, so this is God speaking to Ezekiel, it says, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll. And go speak unto the house of Israel. So he says, eat this roll. It's not a bread roll, okay? It's a roll like a, like a manuscript, right? So it's the words of God. It's the scriptures is what it is. And it says here in verse number two, So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So he's consumed the word of God because this is so sweet, awesome. He's getting ready to be a preacher for Israel, right? And listen, when you prepare to preach God's word, I'm sure for many of you it's sweet as you do it. Oh man, awesome, getting this together, it's going to be a good sermon, it's going to help people in church. You know, it's sweet, right? That's what you think as a preacher, right? Nothing wrong with thinking that. But then it says this, verse number five, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech, or of an hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech, of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Then he says this, Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. So he says, look, if I sent you to the Gentiles, of other people of other nations, gonna, they, they would definitely listen to you. But he says, I'm sending to you to Israel, he says, right? And this is this, verse number seven. But the house of Israel will not hearken <laughs> to thee. They would have hearkened, sorry, they would have hearkened unto thee. Sorry, I'll read that again, verse number seven. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. And so Ezekiel here, you know, he takes, he, he eats that roll, he eats the, the word of God, and he wants to preach it. He says, this is sweet, this is delicious, this is awesome. He thinks Israel is going to love hearing this. And God says, no, they're not going to listen to you. <laughs> okay, so here's the truth about God's word. It can be sweet to you. But don't be surprised when it's not sweet to other people, <laughs> all right? It's just, just a, a reality that will dawn on you eventually. You guys are in Revelation, right? Go to Revelation chapter 10. It's a reality that will dawn on you. If it hasn't dawned on you already, it's going to dawn on you at some point. When you're like, you're so excited, you found something great in the Bible, you go to somebody else and you show them, and they're like, come on, man, you're obsessed. You're, you're part of a cult. What, so you believe I'm not good enough to go to heaven? And you, right, you're missing the point. It's a free gift. <laughs> it's sweet. It's beautiful. You know, they won't hearken unto you many times because what is sweet to you is not necessarily sweet to others. Revelation chapter 10, verse number 9. We have another story here where John the Apostle eats a book as well, a roll, if you will. Verse number 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So again, this is another reference to the Word of God, right? Being sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. 
and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so here John is said, Yeah, you're going to prophesy again, you know, to, to people everywhere. But what was the lesson that he had to learn there? That boy, he, he had that book, the little book, he ate it. He goes, This is sweet, like honey. This is awesome. But then when he hit his belly, when he was able to digest it, when he was able to process it, he found it bitter. And that's the truth of the Bible, right? You come to church, you, you want a bit of that honey sometimes, you want to keep some good preaching, so I, wa I want the sweetness of God's Word in my life. But then sometimes, as you think about it, as you meditate on what you're hearing, as you receive what you're hearing, it becomes bitter in your belly. And you know what? What I just said about flat earth, I'm sure some flat earthers might have found some of it sweet, but eventually it's going to be bitter. Right? It's going to be bitter because it's going to be like, well, this challenges my belief. And brethren, that's good preaching though. That's the Bible. You know, it shouldn't always be just sweet and beautiful. At some point, it's got to hit on your sins. And at some point, I hope you've been sitting in your chairs and go, this is bitter preaching. I don't like it. It was sweet originally, but now that I think about it, that means in my life, I've got to make changes. That means in my life, you're telling me I've got these sins. That means in my life, you're telling me that I need to make these changes. That means in my life, you're telling me that I've got to be more loving to my brethren. Well, that becomes bitter to me because I need to make changes. That's hard to do. And yet it's sweet. People love hard preaching when it's preaching against somebody else. <laughs> but they don't like hard preaching when it's about them. Okay? Because it's bitter. It's sweet and bitter. And that's just the reality of God's Word. So just a reminder, you know, don't forget, the reason you come to this church is you want to come here in the whole counsel of God all the counsel of God, parts of it to you are going to be sweet and parts of it are going to be bitter as you sit there and digest what you have to hear. All right, back to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse number 11. Psalm 19, verse number 11. It says, Moreover by them, by the words of God that is, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So knowing God's word will cause you to be warned from dangers, from sins, from things that can hurt you, but it also, if you keep them, there's great re reward. Now, I'll just read to you from Matthew 5, 19, words of Jesus Christ. He says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so if we keep God's words, we do His commandments, then we're going to have a greater position in heaven. There's greater rewards. The more you serve the Lord, the more you try to live a godly life, a biblical life, there's a greater reward for you in heaven. All right? And not only is the benefit in heaven, but the benefit's here on the earth. All right? You're warned by the dangers that can come into your life should you allow yourself to live a sinful, wicked life. Verse number 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And I love that because the psalmist is basically saying, you know, he's saying, who can fully understand his errors, right? Only God can know the mistakes, fully understand the makes, mistakes that you make. There are many mistakes that you've made already, and you don't even know they're mistakes, <laughs> you know? But God knows, right? And that's why he says, he cleanse me. He says to God, cleanse me, th thou me, from secret faults. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, only God can know your heart. And so what we're seeing in this psalmist, you know, he wants to glorify God. He wants to live righteously, but at the same time he realizes, well, there's errors in my life. You know, there's errors, and I don't even know what they are, oh God. Can you please highlight them to me? Can you please show me? And of course, he gets shown that by the Word of God. But then he says, cleanse thou me from secret faults. And again, that's the asking for forgiveness. That should be a part of your life, your daily life. When you make faults, when you make mistakes, when you sin against the Lord, ask the Lord, can you cleanse me, Lord? Can you forgive me, Lord? I've messed up again. That should be part of your life. You see, this is part of the psalmist's life, right? Verse number 13. He says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. So he goes, Not only forgive me for the sins that I've done, but keep me from making these mistakes, Lord. Lest them not have dominion, sorry, let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And so the psalmist wants to walk spiritually with the Lord. You know, he wants to have good fellowship with the Lord, right? He wants the Lord to help him overcome his sins. And brethren, you need the Lord's help to overcome your sins. You need the Lord's help to turn from those sins in your life that you have today. You can't do it in your own strength. 
You know, you can't do it in your own strength. You can only do it through the new man, the new creation that God puts in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're walking in the new man, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to be able to find yourself having greater victory over the sins in your life. That should be part of our Christian life, trying to clean ourselves up. Not for salvation, we're saved already because of Christ, but because we want to please the Lord, because we want to be able to fellowship with the Lord, right? Have a good life that the Lord can be pleased of. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says in His Prayer, He says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. And, so, you know, that's, that should be part of your prayer. Lord, help me. You know, I struggle with this sin. Please help me avoid the temptation so I don't have to do that sin in my life. And Lord, if I find myself in that temptation, please find a way for me to get out of that. Okay? Deliver me from evil. You know, we ought to be striving to live clean lives. Look at verse number 14. Let the words of my... And this is the, the finale of this all, right? <clears throat> and this is so important. It says, and the, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Beautiful words from the psalmist, right? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. I think this is probably the hardest, potentially the hardest challenge in your Christian life to clean the inside, right? I mean, the outward stuff is sometimes easier, like going to church, picking up your Bible and reading it, right? You know, fellowshipping with the brethren. The outward stuff is a little bit easier, but the sins of the heart, the sins of the mind, the things that come out of your mouth, they're harder to control, right? And so the psalmist is not only thinking about the outward sins, the things that he's done in his body physically, but he's also thinking about the things that he meditates on, you know, his thought life, the things that are in his heart, and he says, Lord, I want those things in my heart to be acceptable in thy sight. Can you tell me that, brethren, today? That everything you've thought about, everything that you spent time meditating on in your mind, internally, has been acceptable to God? You probably say, no, it hasn't all been acceptable. Well, we need to clean that part up as well, okay? It's not just the outward sins that we do in our body, but the inward thoughts of the inner man, you know, that you think is hidden from the rest of the world. God knows them. You know, and God wants to help you overcome those foolish thoughts, those wicked thoughts, you know, and get those sins out of your life as well. All right, let's uh, take this opportunity to sing Psalm 19, huh? We, have, we normally sing Psalm 19 every now and again. So let's uh, sing Psalm 19, and then we'll, we'll close the service. Psalm 19, if you remember how it goes, we start with verse number 7. Start with verse number 7, and we use verse number 10 as our chorus. Remember that? All right, let's see how we go. Verse number seven. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Oh, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse number eight. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 11, Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. More to be desired are they than go, yea, than much fine go, oh, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to